And we are live on Oz Property Investors. We bring the big names and we have the big fun. How are you going, Amanda? How's your day? Fantastic. I'm feeling great. I am ready to be your uh, Strata superhero tonight. Oh. I brought my cape. Is I that love it. Wow. You're after? Yes, I do. I actually have a cape. There you I go. Feel, I, wow. feel under, I feel underdressed now. I should have bought some sort of para- I mean, I do actually have a, uh, yeah. I do have some, I do have a superhero. I should have worn that shirt. I, I, that's okay. But yeah, no, that's it's, that's fantastic. It's uh, we've been, we were talking before about the Strata conference that you're going to and or have gone to, and and that's where you gain some inspiration for the uh, for that for the case that you're going to be sharing in Tam- Tamara 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 Tamarama Tamarama I always get yes. So, I, I spent oh, half oh. the day online with the Australian College of Strata Lawyers. It's our 18th annual conference and wow. because we can't get together in person we are online for the next three days and uh sky at tamarama that building was a, a case study in our conference today and i just went ding you guys need to know about this development yeah. let's talk about we, it tonight we definitely let's talk about uh let's talk about tamara i'm, not, I'm just gonna let joe say it. i'm gonna call it the tea suburb uh, but uh tamarama. How you going? yeah yeah you say how you going anyway joe what's what's been happening buddy I'm fantastic, mate. I'm fantastic. We're just, uh, the market's hot right now. Everyone's buying property. It's absolutely ridiculous. Um, so I'm having a blast. Um, what about you, Jeff? How are you, mate? You've got a little, uh, little cocktail going. Is that it's, it's strawberries watermelon. in it? A watermelon, uh, yeah, watermelon kind of thing. Watermelon it's float. A, water, yes. Yeah, it's, it's a non-alcoholic exciting time. But, um, but no, I'm, I'm really fantastic. It was a beautiful day today. So too, too nice to be in front of my computer, but I was. So, so no, going really, um, going really well, Joe, and just excited about this session because um, I, we we don't often get to speak to the Strata, a Strata lawyer and, and just somebody who has the breadth of knowledge and experience, I suppose, and and is able to not only talk to the the stuff you need to know, but also the the kind of more ex, not more exciting, but the, I suppose the the more yeah, um, it's more ca- exciting. Yeah, well, well, opportun- <laughs> well, there's opportunities in Strata, which I, I never thought about that way before until we kind of plan this session so I, I want to see comments i want to see questions and we've got a bunch of them come through so shall we shall we get into get into the quote of the week joe shall we let the guest i know that i mean has got a quote so what is your Ooh. quote of the recommender my quote all right you're sneaking up on me here my quote of the week is this you can't do everything but you can do one thing and then another and another in terms of energy, it's better to make a wrong choice than none at all. And that is from this book here, George Leonard, Mastery, Ooh. The Keys to Success and Long-Term Fulfillment. Oh, big promise. Big promise. And I thought it was a great quote to bring to your audience because, you know, property investing, like anything worth doing in life, is one step at a time and you just got to get started. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, otherwise, so many people sort of, uh, I mean, Joe, I mean, I won't talk so much for Joe, but me, myself, I sort of took a while to get going, sort of three to five years in that, uh, three to four years in the analysis paralysis. So 100% it's kind of about taking those sort of, Biting the how do you know for one one uh, one bite at a time, as they say? So, yeah, awesome quote. And I have to put that book on the list. How about, how about, yeah. how about you, Jack? Mate, my um. My, my quote is, as we've got this superhero theme, I thought I would pull up a Superman quote. Um, oh. I When I was, there it is, <clears throat> when I was um, about four or five, I realized that just because you wear a Superman outfit does mean, doesn't mean you can't, you can fly. So I realized I jumped off the one, I jumped when I was a kid, I jumped off our roof um, in a Superman outfit and realized I couldn't fly. So um, that was a sad day for me. Uh, but one of Superman's That's quotes cool. is, you're, <laughs> you're much strong. <laughs> this is, this is, this is true. Actually, you're much stronger than you think you are. Trust me. I was fine. Like I landed, I was fine. Um, but kids bounce, so that was fine. So that's my that's my quote of the week. That's what Superman said. Don't jump off roofs, kid. Kids. There we go. What about you, Jeff? What's your quote of the week, mate? 
public service announcement. So uh, in, in going with the old jumping off, we wouldn't encourage people to jump off roofs, particularly no. even if they do have a cape and thing. But but my one's from Helen Keller. And I look at and reflect on these every week and sort of see. Um, so Helen Keller, I don't know how many people know the story. I'm not going to tell um, the whole story, but she was she was blind. She did amazing things so in her time. She achieved, I believe she was an inventor or she did. She was involved, quite involved in uh, in, in doing a lot of um, sort of politi- uh, political um, activism, but I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm sorry if that's incorrect. But um, so she said, life is either a daring adventure or nothing at all. So I think um, in speaking about superheroes and, and just she is somebody who I think is an underrated sort of. I mean, maybe she's not underrated, but I think she should get spoke about more. So the amount of things that she achieved with um, in in the in the nineteenth century, I believe she was, or, yeah, nineteenth century, so eighteen hundreds. Um, and she just did amazing things for, I believe, women um, in that time. So that's my quote. Fantastic nice quote. One. There you go. Let's do yeah. it. Okay. Well, I'm excited for this one. Like Strata is one of those things that that you don't ever think about. It's kind of something that's in the background, and it just kind of it kind of happens until you buy a, a property, and it's like in a, it's a unit or it's a townhouse or it's a a duplex with a Strata, or maybe we can. We can talk about that as well, but um, I'm interested in all the opportunities that there are, Amanda. So I'm, I'm pumped. I'm mm. pumped for this one. Um, yeah. So I, I can see through being in your community for a little while that Strata gets a little bit of a bad rap. A bit of a bad rap yeah. in the group sometimes. Yeah. When people put some posts out there. I'm thinking of buying Strata. No, don't do it. Don't do it. Well, I'm hoping I can change some minds tonight, maybe. Yeah. It's uh, it. recently we had some property manager questions as well, which um, that's an interesting one that we've uh, I've had to turn off comedy and some of those. But anyway, that's we're not here. <laughs> to talk about property we're here to God, talk okay. About strata. We're here to talk about Strata. Well, let's run our um, before we introduce this wonderful Amanda. Um, let's jump into our sponsor post, and then we'll run roll straight into introducing who this wonderful person is. Let's do it. Commercial property offers the highest cash flow in Australian property investing, offering exceptionally higher yields than residential. Now we're talking eight to 10% net yields. That's cash after all expenses, not this two to 6% gross that we see in the residential space. So for those that are starting out on their commercial investing journey, it can be exciting, but it's also a step not to be taken lightly. The expertise of a commercial buyer's agent can pay dividends to help you secure that high cash flow and high growth potential property. And this is why we recommend Steve Polisi of Polisi Property. With over six years experience in the space, Steve has over 1,200 property transactions under his belt. He has seen it all and knows the best locations right for growth. In a previous life, Steve was a chartered mechanical and structural engineer, so he draws on his mathematical and analytical skills that he's developed to break down what works best in commercial property. As with engineering, same goes with commercial property. It's based primarily on the numbers. So if you're curious about diversifying into commercial property, you have access to $100,000 in cash or in equity, book a call with Steve today and find that perfect asset for you. There we go, Joe. I don't know. So it was, it was interesting. Some people in the comments already talking. They were clicking the refresh button to see the session start. That's how excited they are about Strata. I was. I mean, that's why I said we have to go. We should go live at seven thirty. But anyway, that's we'll, we'll we'll work on that next week. But uh, but if you're watching, as I said, we want the questions, the comments, and even if you're watching the replay on YouTube, we love the. I, I love interaction because I actually look at it. And I, I have screenshot and I sent it to Joe. But it's not about that. It is about Amanda, the Strata superhero. So I'm gonna I'm gonna give you. So I, I accidentally called you a strata. I think I called you a strata manager. I think people thought we talk. So you are a lawyer, which I mean, you should hear the difference. We'll it's an insult. No, <laughs> oh, maybe it is. I, I don't know. Maybe oh, yeah. I mean, I, I no, not at all, not at all, Jeff. And I'm not <laughs> surprised that you uh, had that confusion. It is something that's happened before. I have had um, people say to me, "Amanda, this uh, this strata law gig, this seems pretty cool, pretty interesting. Um, how how do I get into it? So, how do I become a strata lawyer? Do you have like a degree?" 
and I say, yeah, I, I have a law degree. Um, yeah, I'm actually a, a property lawyer. <laughs> that's, that's a five-year degree, isn't it? Property five, five or six, lawyer. depending on depending on how you want to do oh, it. So, yeah, a little yeah. different to a strata manager, but we definitely inhabit the same space. I work with strata managers every day very closely, um, try to understand their world as much as I can so that I can help them and help the buildings that they manage. Yeah, and and another thing uh, to to give you a bit more of an intro, um, you you are passionate about demystifying the complexities of apartment living. So I think that's that's something that having sort of lived in apartments and and owned sort of strata, it's something I think that uh, I mean I didn't find it particularly <clears throat> complicated, but but I was somewhat I was fairly engaged with the process. I didn't join the committee. But I was sort of I kept up with the minutes and read, was reading and doing lots of stuff. So I think it's important to, to sort of um, to demystify that. But you're also I suppose you also uh, are a very well sought after speaker and educator. So you had 17 years of sort of doing doing this uh, education as as a and doing sort of web, uh, webinars or seminars, right. whatever they do. Is that. So the thing that I'm I'm, ex, uh, I'm interested in sort of um, that you've presented for the RE the Real Real Estate Institute of New South Wales. And, but also Owners Corp, and you've done sort of a whole bunch of other. So you've, you're not just presenting to, I suppose, the, the Rotary Club down, mm -hmm. down the street about this. You're actually presenting to some very sort of high-level, sophisticated, uh, sort of very sort of uh, awesome organisations. So um, I'll take the Rotary fun. Club too if they want me. No, I think <laughs> Rotary's fantastic. I mean, I, 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 yeah, not to sell the Rotary Club <laughs> down the stream, sorry. I, I've been to a couple of Rory Club meetings, and that's uh, no. So, what sort of things that I should I have covered off in the intro that I didn't cover off? What, what things no, it sounds good. Look, I I am a practicing strata lawyer. I do have my own legal practice in Sydney. It's called Lawyers Chambers. Uh, but a big bulk of my work now is focused on education, educating owners, committee members, developers, <laughs> local councils, uh, tenants, residents in strata schemes, helping them to understand, as you say, the legal complexities of apartment living to uh, restore peace to troubled communities and to make your investment more profitable if you are an investor in strata or thinking about it yeah that's a that's, that's a nice feel that was much more succinct than what i said but uh no it's not my first radio <laughs> yes. it's not your first rotary <laughs> <laughs> So what can we just have a higher level overview for people that are kind of confused about what strata actually is? What is strata? When we're using the word strata, what are, what are we saying? Yeah, so strata is a form of titling, land titling. So it's a way of actually parceling up airspace so that you can sell airspace instead of selling pockets of land. And that allows us to have more dense communities, to build these high rises and to make better use of our uh, growing uh, population, make sure we can house our growing population. So it's known by different terms. Uh, being in your group for a while, I can see most people are familiar with the term strata, body corporate. So our Queenslanders will often use the term body corporate. Owners corporations, we have owners corporations in New South Wales and in Victoria, strata companies in Western Australia. Uh, but if I say strata and community title, um, it, it's a form of titling so that we can sell and uh, make use of um, airspace in a way that the law otherwise wouldn't allow us to do. Interesting. Yeah, what, what, what sort of, um, I mean, who, who, who sort of thought about, uh, I mean, this is a sort of a, Maybe not going back into history. Who created well, who, strata? Well, is, who made that happen? Like, do you know the history yeah. of? Look, there's there is a myth that the Australians actually created strata. Oh, we created everything. But it's we something everything. that we invented. I think um, I, I, I can perpetuate that myth because it makes us all feel good, but it's not actually true. Um, we've had homeowner associations and condominium <laughs> developments over in the US for many, many years, longer than we have in Australia. Um, and it was in the US, it was actually a way of regulating who could live in communities. And it was a way of actually excluding certain people of certain backgrounds from communities. And you couldn't do it through normal property wow. easements and restrictions uh, and covenants. That became illegal. But what you could do is build a homeowner association, a community, and then have rules in that community 
made by the community that only allowed certain people of a certain background, of a certain race to live in the community. So it's actually got kind of a nasty uh, history, at least there in the US, and that their history is quite a bit longer than ours. Yeah, there you go. I did, wow. I did, not, I did not know that. That's, 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 yeah, you learn something new every day. But, uh, it's sort of <laughs> I have a feeling we're going to learn a lot of things new today um, in the in the strata world. My question is, how important is it, and how easy? Well, what's the level of difficulty to actually get on the committee? Com sorry, committee of a strata. Like, is, is that something question. we should be bothering doing? Like, I I'm not on the committee of my strata because I just don't want any emails. Um, but should I that a lot. should I be? <laughs> yes. Look. I, uh, that is a great question to dive straight into. I do recommend that if you are going to be investing significant sums of money, as we do in property in this country, anywhere, that you take an interest in that investment. And when we're talking about strata, body corporates, community title, the best way to have a seat at the table when it comes to decision making, to understand what's going on and why decisions are being made, to be able to have a say about how much money is raised, what your levies are, what that money is spent on, you really do need to be part of the committee. And when everything's going well, everything's going smoothly in a community, there's no um, turbulence and there's no major disputes and there's no big repairs coming up, everything's fine and you don't notice and your investment just ticks along. But it's when that difficult resident, the, the sociopath moves in to <laughs> Unit 3 and starts complaining about everything and you end up dealing with litigation. It's when the roof, 25-year-old roof membrane needs replacing and quotes come in and they're 100 grand, they're 150 grand. If you're not on the committee, you're not going to understand what's happening and you're not going to have a seat at that table to be making decisions because because committees can make some pretty hefty serious decisions and to be able to put options forward and you're all smart people here um, you're exactly the people that we need on our strata committees yeah it's it's really uh it's really interesting because when you talk about roofs that uh, we sort of often do walks around a neighborhood and we can sort of see uh, there's a there's a strata sort of building that's getting significant roofing sort of done to it at the moment i just i, I think it might be sort of community mm -hmm. public housing so i don't know how that sort of gets i mean that maybe there's not um, sort of, but it's just interesting this sort of year you talk through when that happens that uh, that'd be an interesting process to be part of when it, if it were to happen um can, can i take a step back because i i we love asking people about their first investments i think this will tie in quite nicely to your uh your investing your strata journey so tell us about that first property you bought and what you did First property that I bought, I was trying to think back when this was and how old I was. I think I must have been about 24. And my first property was a strata apartment in Sydney's eastern suburbs. That's where I grew up and have spent most of my life. And I knew, I knew a little bit about strata. I was working as a student in a firm that did a bit of strata law and I had almost finished my law degree. And that was part of my plan, my strategy. I'd been living at home throughout university and saving my deposit and I would buy an apartment when I got that contract for my full-time lawyer role. Uh, and what I bought at that mm. time was on the top floor of a three-story red brick walk-up. Uh, it was in Kingsford, for those who know Sydney's East. Uh, very, very straightforward uh, garage parking, older style as our red brick walk-ups are, uh, and about eight lots, eight units in that building. And that was really what I was looking at, what I was looking for, knowing a little bit about Strata, that I wanted reasonably small block, definitely mm. older style you wanted that parking. Um, and it turned out to be uh, a pretty good investment because uh, I'm, I don't know if you want me to keep going into the story of yeah. how uh, yeah, yeah, I yeah. was able to apply my strata knowledge to um, make some money on that place. But the like a lot of these old red bricks in the east, there's the garage, the garages that are on the ground level and then there is the... Uh, envelope that's just the concrete envelope that's just in front of the garages where everybody parks their second car or where the boyfriend parks his car or where mum parks when she comes to visit and everybody had this space in front of their garage and I suggested that all of the owners agree to make a bylaw which granted each owner the exclusive use of that part of the common property that was in front of their garage and that way they could then be legally 
parking on the common property. Everyone was doing it anyway. It was illegal. But what they could also do was then legally advertise their properties when they went to sell or when they went to rent them as properties with two parking spaces instead of one. And in the eastern suburbs, getting an extra parking space is, you know, worth tens of thousands of dollars back then. Uh, yeah. Everybody said, who is this? girl and why does she know something about strata that sounds like a good idea yeah let's do that is that easy Amanda I said yeah I've got a template I've got a bylaw template got it from my boss I'll uh, put it before the meeting we just have to vote for it we all have to agree that we're getting exclusive use of these areas of human property register it and there you go you've got one space on title and you've got one space pursuant to a bylaw oh there you go so you just created a car parking space out of thin air which then allows you to advertise your property for two parking spaces on, on well, the real estate.com and also exactly. RP data as well, which probably all the banks look at and say, oh, well, this is a, you know, three bed, two bath, one, one car space, which is worth X, and then two car spaces is worth Y. So that lifts the value entirely. Do you, yep. I'm going to ask you a question of Joe. Do you, do you think they would, I mean, I don't know how in the areas you, you, sort of, you sort of look at, Joe, do you think that they would actually, because would there be any comparable sales for a two parking space? I mean, well, was there a member or was that something that you, you sort of looked at? And sort of said, Probably not really, not in that age building, in that location. Um, yeah. yeah, pretty dense there in Kingsford, close to the university. No, it would have been, it would have been unusual, yep. yeah. Yeah. So, so I suppose it is, it is extra value when, when somebody... I mean, we're, we're, so, so you're looking from a strata perspective. But I, I just I, I put my investors' cap on and say, how much, how much can I, can I potentially get an extra fifty thousand dollars out of a va bank valuation, which is then potentially where you can go and maybe buy leverage to buy another property. But that's um that's amazing. So oh sorry, about and it that. really didn't cost it didn't cost the owners anything because it was just a matter of drawing up the document, getting it registered. There would have been a two hundred fifty dollar registration fee. So whether you've added fifty grand or you've added twenty grand, um, you're ahead. Yeah. Well, so, so how does, uh, is this something that uh, a lot of people are, I mean, obviously it has to be right for the area, but is this the type of thing that you help educate your, uh, your sort of, your, I suppose, your, your property owners on in your courses or, or this is... This is definitely becoming more popular now. So I'm talking about 14, 15 years ago. This yeah. is definitely becoming more popular now and it's something that I want your audience to be attuned to that if you are purchasing Strata that you're looking for properties that may have these opportunities. So opportunities for you if you're buying an apartment for you to extend into common space that might be adjacent. So there might be a garden, there might be a courtyard, there might be some pathway that is only really useful for, for you and for your tenants living in your property. And you might purchase the property with that in mind in some way down the track after you have become good friends with your fellow owners, after you've served some good time on the committee, made some good decisions. Everybody's thinking, well, this is a smart cookie. Um, we really like this new owner that you put up your hand and say, hey, by the way, you know that courtyard that's out the back that only I have access to, that only I can use? Oh, yeah, yeah. Look, I'll look after it. I'll maintain it. I'll, I'll mow the lawn each week. Um, will you agree to make a bylaw that gives me exclusive use of that area? Wow. Oh, yeah, I guess so. Nobody else uses it. I suppose if you're going to look after it, yeah, okay, no problem. And the building may agree to that kind of arrangement, which is perfectly legal. Um, and there's people out there increasing the value of their investments by having those arrangements in place. Wow. Right. Yeah, that's because they're reducing example. the... That's that's just reducing the expenses that the the rest of the building have to pay by servicing this property. Hey, we want to reduce your strata bill. I use it all the time. I'll take it take it off your hands for nothing. <laughs> exactly. And look, something really popular now is attic spaces, roof space. So you've bought the top floor apartment, and you know that there's a roof cavity there, and you can extend to actually create another room, a study, a storage area in that roof space. And we know there's wow. companies out there that specialize in building these things, uh, not all that expensive. And having the right pursuant to a bylaw, or alternatively, we can get into how you would subdivide and actually purchase that area of the common property. That's that's different. Um, but lots of owners who are purchasing areas of the common property, which it is, then becomes their legal title, no one can take that away from them. Um, 
to to make those extensions and to add value that way. And those are reasonably small projects. If you've got equity in the property, uh, if you're in an area that maybe there's views, if you go up higher, um, you could add a lot of value that way. Yeah. Bloody hell. Are you seeing people out there doing this stuff? Like, is this and like... A, so looking out his window now to see if he can go and Literally, I was. I'm like, actually, there is there is a roof space there. And, and do you know what? You are now <laughs> going to drive around and your audience is going to drive around town and you're going to see, you're going to look at these um, usually older buildings and you're going to see the little attic spaces that have been built. And you're going to see the little dormer windows that are up the top there on the roof and you're going to go, oh. That's what Amanda was talking about. That lucky person purchased that area or has a bylaw that has allowed them to extend into that area and now they're enjoying that space. They're getting more rent. They've increased their value. That's what she's talking about because they, they often stick out like sore thumbs because it's the new addition to the old building. Um, yeah. But, yeah, I see it a lot. I've got a couple of clients in my books at the moment that I'm helping them do that with. So Okay. So how do we do how do we do that process? So is the first thing to obviously watch this Facebook live and then get the idea and then jump on the phone with you or like how do we how if do we make this on, happen? If you jump on the phone with me, what I'm going to ask you and we go back to this very that very good question you asked Joe about being on the committee. I'm going to ask mm. you, all right, who are your neighbors? Who are you? What is your involvement in the building? How long have you been there? Do you live there? No, we don't. We're invested. Are your tenants good? You have good tenants who are not annoying people. So essentially, does the community like you? Because you need to get some airtime with them to have this discussion. Because yeah. to pass a bylaw, it has to be agreed at a meeting and you need a, a special resolution in New South Wales. You need a special resolution to pass a bylaw. So that's most people. We, we say generally that 75% of people supporting this proposal. So what you want to do before you spend any money on lawyers or drawing up documents uh, or even going to the contractors and getting quotes is that you want to feel out the owners and see if they'd be on board with this. Because you might be met with, absolutely not. The guy who owned this place before you wanted to do that, we said, no, we're never doing it. Or they might say, yeah, no problem. It's 200 grand, which yeah. they, they may do. They're, in, they're entitled to sell their common property, put a price on their common property. If they say that, yeah. then you've got to work out yeah. whether that's in your strategy or not. There's, there's plenty of owners out there purchasing common property because they see the value that adds. Wow. I, this, is, uh, this is really opening my mind because I, I've never thought that this could be I mean, maybe, yeah, it's just really interesting. That I'd never thought that this is a, a pathway before. So um, do, do you, so say somebody's looking to, to do these um, sort of strategies, they look at a property that they haven't bought it yet. Um, so, and they're, and they're sort of saying, okay, I want to target this property for this specific strategy. What, what, how do, what sort of due diligence or what sort of checks can somebody do? I mean, is it possible to do it before you buy something or probably not? Yes, it is possible to do some level of due diligence before you buy, definitely. Um, I saw a post in the group from uh, Eric, I think it was, if I've got Eric's name right, just yesterday, who was saying, I've got my eye on an apartment in Edgecliff. Uh, what do you think? Should I buy it? And I was reading through the comments and I ended up posting, hey, Eric, I think you should come and listen to this chat tonight. Um, because I didn't see anybody. Hey, it was crickets. I didn't see anybody <laughs> saying Eric, go and look at the books and records of the owner's corporation. Absolutely number one. There was talk about yield. There was talk about the size, the location, the train station. Great. But you have no idea how healthy or unwell that owner's corporation is. As I said, yeah. it has a sociopath just moved in next door and causing a world of pain. And we're in the Supreme Court with law paying lawyers 200 grand a year to defend proceedings. Yeah, are there building defects? Uh, is there a special levy coming up? Is there a strata loan that needs to be paid out? Is there a reason that this owner is selling? Uh, so making an appointment with the strata manager, and that's where we strata managers come in, they are the holder of the owner's corporations, the body corporate's books and records, make an appointment to go and look at those records. Most managers have their systems online now, so it's just a matter of logging in and going through everything uh, and make an assessment of how healthy that building is. What do the financials look like? Is there money in the sinking fund or the capital works fund? Um, I, I, I've, I'm amused when I see these posts on your on your group that say, it's Strata, should I buy it? There's, there's yeah. a whole whole homework piece to be done around that. So what yeah. does a healthy strata look like? 
Well, there's money in the fund, yes. So we have sinking funds or capital works funds. We call them capital works funds in New South Wales. There's sinking funds in Queensland. Um, but, you know, in terms of how much money, how long is a piece of string? What's coming up for that building? There might be 300 grand in the capital works fund, but we've just approved a quote to replace the lift. So that 300 grand is about to be wiped out. Um, yeah. that, that is a reasonably healthy building, A, that they actually have a budget to replace the lift and they're not going to take out a loan or strike a special levy that everybody has to just fork out 25 grand each that they weren't otherwise budgeting for. So to have money set aside for major capital work is, is a big deal. And I'd say that's a healthy building. Um, buildings should have plans. So 10 year plans for their capital works funds so that they can mm. be budgeting. Um, some people don't like buying strata because they say, oh, there's levies. Well, levies is really forced saving and forced budgeting which you don't otherwise do when you have a freestanding property. You know, the gutters start to leak and you go, oh, crap, I'm going to have to go and find some money to fix that. When you're in a healthy building, that money is there because you planned for that event. Um, I always say when you're looking at books and records, have a look at the email communications that are going back and forth between committee members and also the strata manager. So is everybody friendly? Are they nice? to each other? What is the general uh, feel of the community, the level of harmony? Um, you're looking for a really harmonious community. If we've got three sets of tribunal proceedings and a Supreme Court case on, there's probably not a community that we want to join. Um, buildings will be insured. You know, insurance is just a ticker box thing. That's It's very rare for a building not to be insured. Um, you want to have a look at the bylaws or the rules. In Victoria, you call them rules because that's also going to tell you a lot about how this community runs, what's allowed, what's not. And as investors, you want to be looking at bylaws that relate to short-term letting. If you want a short-term let, or if you want to be in a building that doesn't allow short-term letting. Because in New South Wales, we have new legislation where strata buildings can actually ban short-term letting. And I've got a few investor clients who've been caught short Ooh, about that and are coming to me saying, well, Amanda, we're allowed to short-term let. Didn't the, the planning laws change to allow us to short-term let? Isn't it exempt development? Yes, but in a strata building, if it's not your principal place of residence in New South Wales, then the owner's corporation can prevent you from short-term letting. Wow. So, 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 you, so you can actually, so you could have an owner occupier and then short term let. But if it's an investment, you can't? Is that, or, or you may be Correct. If it's your principal place of residence, then wow. you can't, if it's your principal place of residence, you can short term let and the owner's corporation can't ban you from short term letting. If it's, <laughs> if it's an investment, uh, you're an investor owner you're a, you, and you've purchased the property for the purpose of just having short-term tenants, you're on Airbnb, you're on stays, as so many of us were doing, uh, the owners' corporation can ban that activity. I'd say um, it's, a, it's a good uh, reminder for me to say that none of this, folks, is legal advice or, or all that sort of financial advice. I'm surprised you didn't say it before me. I, was, I mean, I wasn't waiting, but um, no, I mean, because that, that's the kind of thing that I feel that could be sort of, there could be some grey area there. I'm, I'm not... I don't think we'll continue down that path because otherwise you could sort of say, I mean, I don't know, how do you prove that it's going to rock or not? I mean, I suppose you, you register your postal address there, but um, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, that's that's probably yeah. a conversation that uh, you need to have with your legal representative to figure out. So yeah. what's a, what, is, what is a bylaw? How would you describe a bylaw? So a bylaw is a written instrument. It might be 10 pages long. It might be three lines long. Okay. It might say... In this building, no one is allowed to hang their washing on the balcony. So you can have a bylaw that says that. Yeah, Many buildings have bylaws that say that. I think you I have, have that in my building. I think yep. I saw that. I was reading through the strata stuff and I'm like, not allowed to have clothes on the balcony. Yes. Um, and there are, there are um, there's almost a template or a standard set of bylaws that is actually in our legislation in all states. And the standard set of bylaws usually gets registered by the developer with the strata plan. So everybody kind of starts with the standard set of bylaws and it deals with noise and rubbish and washing and appearance and uh, cosmetic work. Um, and then over time, the bylaws can be changed. They can be repealed, they can be added to, they can be replaced. Um, and that's where we end up with 
by lawyers drafting 10 page bylaws and people's bylaws looking like encycl encyclopedias um but bylaws are enforceable you have to comply with them owners and occupiers have to comply with them if you don't you face penalties before the tribunal uh, and that's where we start talking about ncat i don't know if anybody's heard of ncat the new south wales civil and administrative tribunal qcat vcat uh, and in western australia it's called sat so yeah there are tribunals that regulate our uh, strata communities. Yeah. How did how did W? Oh, how did, how did the, the WCAT WCAT doesn't really. Doesn't, it do, doesn't no, it work. doesn't. Uh, the state administrative <laughs> tribunal they call themselves because Western Australia okay. is quite separate from everybody else. They are just a little bit. Yeah. So, what are some of the more outrageous um, bylaws you've seen that have actually? <laughs> gotten through and do they have to get approved by everybody is that why we need to be on the committee because we can approve or not approve these these things so bylaws can't be made by the committee they have to be made ah. by the owners in a general meeting so we have committee meetings which is just committee members and then we have general That's meetings cool. which is all owners can go to general meetings and vote at general meetings so bylaws can only be made or changed at general meetings and you do need a special resolution so it's kind of hard to get bylaws across the line. Um, some outrageous bylaws, um, no children playing on common property. That's one that uh, I think as a parent is outrageous and rather old fashioned. And we've seen a lot of those <laughs> repealed over time. Well, how, do you, how, do you, how do you enforce that though? Every time you see a kid out there, you sort of say, oh, look, you, you go and shake your finger and say, no, you can't do that. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, there's been a lot of attention in New South Wales the last 12 months about pets and pet bylaws. So very, very common for many years to have bylaws banning pets. No pets allowed in our building. Now, the law has just changed uh, recently within the last six months or so in New South Wales because uh, Joe Cooper, who was a resident at the Hor in the Horizon building in Darlinghurst, she wanted to keep her miniature schnauzer, Angus, and the Horizon building said, we're a no-pets building, he's not allowed to be here, and she took them all the way to the Court of Appeal, the highest court in New South Wales. And the Court of Appeal made new law last year uh, that set standards for bylaws and basically said that pet bans are illegal because they are harsh, unconscionable and oppressive. Interesting. Wow. Was she someone special? Was she... Uh... She is now. Probably, probably. She is now. She's, she she is a very brave now. lady. Um, uh, I am a, a pet lover and have pets in apartments. Uh, and she, the fact that she changed the law for so many people who were struggling to have their furry family members with them is a really big deal. Um, and her, her miniature snails, Angus, passed away a couple of months ago. Um, but he's he's now very famous too. <laughs> well, his legacy lives on. It lives on That's for right. the next. Well, ages for a long, long time. Go, Angus. There mm. you go. Um, so going back to some of the more, like where, are the, if I'm looking at uh, an investment property, what are some of the things that I may consider? Because I have, I have heard that, well, personally, I don't invest in anything that has a lift or a pool or a gym because of the uh, substantial fees attached to maintaining and looking after those amenities. Um, mm. but where, where are the, where are some of the other, op, where, where, yeah, I don't know. What, what are your kind of investing frameworks around investing in stratas? Yeah, look, I, I'm on a similar page to you in, in terms of amenities, but it really depends how you want to use the property, I suppose, because I've seen some members of your group say things like, oh, I love all of that stuff for my tenants because tenants love that and tenants want to pay high rents for that. Um, and, and now that we're looking at into the future at developments being built solely build to rent and being that really high end, um, high end offering where people are willing, professional people willing to pay very high rent to have the movie theater and the building manager and the caretaker, um, I think maybe that's changing if you're looking purely at your rental return. Um, but I think um, definitely focusing on the, the people and the personalities is really where I come from. And I suppose that's because of my experience as a strata lawyer that I end up dealing with the top 2% of the 5% of worst case scenarios because people are coming to me when they've got a problem, they've got a dispute in their building. And 
almost always it comes down to personalities and and difficult people not being able to to get along with each other if you've got a really great group of people then you can you can forget about all of that you're not going to be there's not going to be infighting you're not going to be in the tribunal at each other and you can focus on value add projects so you can look at things like solar panels okay how do we install some sustainable infrastructure on our apartment that's going to help us save money. We're going to be more environmentally friendly, and this is going to be an attractive investment, both uh, in terms of the, the tenants that I want here and in, and my future sale. Um, how do we install electric vehicle charging? Well, so was, solar panels I'm, I'm and electric vehicle that. charging. Yeah, I was thinking that because I thought, is that is it, do you see more demand for electric vehicle charging? Absolutely. Definitely. Yeah. So, so bylaws to permit electric vehicle charging. I'm doing a lot of those at the moment. Bylaws to permit solar panels. We had a change to our law in New South Wales last year that introduced this concept of sustainability infrastructure. So those things, EV charging and solar panels, and makes it very, very easy for those installations to now be approved. So there's a lower threshold. I talked about it being hard to make a bylaw. If it's a bylaw about sustainability infrastructure, it is not hard at all. It's much easier to get across the line. So I'm looking at buildings that have the opportunity to mm -hmm. add those, to make those improvements. So buildings that maybe have been a little bit, it's got a great community, it's got a good proportion of uh, owner occupiers to investors, and it's the people with ad the attitude of wanting to add value and wanting to improve. Um, penny pinching, if I see penny pinching, oh no, well that quotes $100 more than that quote, so we'll go with that one. I just think, oh no, that is not a community I wanna be part of because they're just not gonna be interested in any capital outlay to improve the community down the track. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I I actually really, um, I really enjoy your sort of, it sounds like you've, you've crafted, uh, although you do it from a, a strata lawyer's perspective, you've almost got like an investment thesis somewhat. You've got a, a tick box and if you're going to invest or not if you're going to invest, but if you're sort of considering investing in strata, here are the here are the things you should be looking out for. So that's some, um, uh, I, I really, it's, it's amazing you've been able to sort of do that. And this is probably, you've probably seen what thousands of strata buildings would you say thousands or at least hundreds maybe or is that yes i definitely uh i know in my online community i'm answering questions for members in our forum every day so i know i'm touching i'm touching issues on thousands of buildings definitely yeah and and there's always something new that's what i i love i think you guys were asking me when we were having a chat earlier about why why strata why are you a strata lawyer and i get asked that a lot and i always say it seems simple or it seems niche or it seems very yeah. narrow field but I, I hope what's already coming across in these 45 minutes is that it's incredibly broad and new and changing and challenging and I do feel that our law which is very much codified in in legislation in statutes just doesn't keep up with these changes so as lawyers we're constantly having to interpret and we've got clients coming to us with new problems we've got an embedded network in our brand new building what is that how does that work can we cancel that contract how do we get out of that what are our rights and obligations okay have and dealt with embedded networks before what's all that about there's always something challenging and as a lawyer that's um very exciting yeah i imagine it would be yeah what, what are some of the other um kind of opportunities out there for just an everyday investor when when going down the the strata route like what else do you see out there Oh, rooftops are always a good idea if you've got a, an eye on some development. I've mentioned if you were a if you were an individual owner wanting to extend into common property, we've talked a little bit about that. But you can, as a collective community, as an entire community, you can actually build on your common property, whether that's your rooftop, a rooftop is common property, or on if you've got some land, you can actually build a new dwelling. The owner's corporation, the body corporate, can build a new dwelling somewhere on the common property and can sell that dwelling, that apart, new apartment, um, and pocket the money from that or use that money to do refurbishments around the building, to do renovations. Um, and I see that becoming more, po more popular with our older buildings where they might have a, a big project coming up, could be concrete cancer. We see that on the eastern beaches in our 40-odd-year-old buildings. Um, concrete cancer, to get rid of that off all the balconies, that could be a million-dollar project um, so buildings are looking at creative ways to to develop their own property to then sell that and that then funds the project um, so i'd be very interested in looking at buildings that had the potential to do something like that 
So yeah. what is that? Like a granny flat out the back? Like yeah, it could well be whatever whatever it is that had that the property has the potential for, and you can um, involve. Again, it, important that I don't give advice, but there's different ways to do it. Uh, I know some buildings actually involve a property developer from the very beginning. So the owners' corporation itself is is not the developer, is not the one doing the job. They've actually got an experienced property developer coming in who understands planning controls, who understands <clears throat> the local area, the council rules, knows what they can build and has the money to fund it straight away. So the owners' corporation could actually be subdividing and selling its airspace without having done anything, without having to foot any construction costs, sell it to that developer. Obviously, there's all sorts of contracts and deeds involved in that. Uh, and then that developer then proceeds to do the development of the airspace, creating a penthouse, perhaps a, a penthouse on a, a flat roof. Um, and then the owners corporation has got its money for its its remediation project. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the creativity, and, and I think as we, particularly in Sydney and, and to some extent Melbourne, but maybe not so much Melbourne, I mean, maybe Brisbane, I, I don't know, I don't want to sort of say that, but I think particularly Sydney with, with the amount of sort of lack of sort of greenfield developments, it's going to be infill and it's, it, it's likely to be these sort of buildings. So, yes, yeah, it's, it's very interesting sort of. Um, so let, let, let's go back to, I mean, I know Joe's all about, I mean, Joe and I both love opportunities, but. Let's just say I'm having an issue with a with, with, with a with a situation in a strata complex, and well, there's a couple of questions that came through on this. Um, how do you what's what would be the first point point of call? Would you speak to your strata management, or what, how would you resolve these sort of what is, what issue it is? Well, it depends what the issue is. Um, if I think about it from the perspective of investors, um, mm -hmm. maybe you've got a difficult tenant and there's been a noise complaint, what's probably going to happen is that the neighbours would have reported the noise to the strata manager. The strata manager would have had a look at the strata role, which is the list of everybody's names and contact details, realised that the property was tenanted and then reported the issue to the property manager. So there's a difference there between a strata manager and a property manager. So a property manager manages the rentals and, and works for you, for the landlord. A strata manager manages the entire strata building, the common property, the repairs and maintenance, the contractors coming and going, works with the committee, and they work for the owner's corporation. All right. Now, you're, you're a member of the owner's corporation or the body corporate because you're an owner, uh, but your property manager works for you and your tenant is going to be communicating with your property manager and your property manager is going to be feeding back complaints to you. So, look, I think as an investor owner, I've definitely been in this position where I've had some difficult tenants. Often happens over Christmas and everybody wants to have parties. Um, the first thing that I do is I communicate directly with the committee. And I say to the committee, uh, I um, have received this complaint. I'm very sorry that this has happened. You can please be assured that I'm taking all steps to address this complaint, communicate with the tenants, find out what's happened. Mm -hmm. um, I think sometimes I've been a resident in an apartment building as well. And I think sometimes investor owners can get a bad name because they don't communicate, they don't interact, they're not on the committee. It's a set and forget uh, and whether that's the case or not, that can be how they're perceived. So when I'm in a building where I, I'm not living there, um, I'm very careful to make sure, uh, I'm usually on the committee because uh, I can't help myself, um, but I'm very careful to make sure that I keep those lines of communication open. So I suppose to answer your question, depending on the problem, I always say and what I teach is that communication is always number one. If you're living in the building and there's a noise issue, go and knock on somebody's door. Go and knock on somebody's door and solve it. Say, hi, um, I can hear you. Would you mind not doing that? The number of people who just don't think to do that or don't feel comfortable doing that always surprises me. Um, and then there's bigger issues, I suppose, like repair and maintenance issues. So uh, the roof is leaking. There is something that you or your tenant are suffering, and that's really important when you're an investor owner to be on top of that and to understand whose responsibility it is. And yeah. if it is the owner's corporation's responsibility to be pushing the owner's corporation to do something about it, to fix it, because if that gets worse then your rental return is going to suffer. Your tenants might move out. They might want reduced rent because the place is moldy, because there's there's water dripping onto their bed. I see this a lot with investors. And dripping I see the problem bed. on far too long. Yes, 
yeah, I see the problem go on far too long. It gets worse. And then the investors come to me and they say, oh, Amanda, should I do so? Does the owners corporation need to fix this? And I say, absolutely. They should have fixed it two years ago. This is, this is awful. Um, and then help them through, through that problem. So just being aware, just being aware of what's going on in the property is such a big deal. Yeah. That's, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I love the, I can really, I, I heard the passion coming through in your voice there about these sort of issues and making sure that, I, I think it's about making sure that people get look, looked after because as, as a, whether you're a property investor, or I suppose if you're a property investor, you're probably a screw. But I think it's important that we sort of do acknowledge that we are providing um, shelter and, 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 a, and, a, hope and a safe space and uh, for, for people to, to live in and, and they're paying us mm. uh, money as a, as a result of that. So, um, so I think it's important that we take that sort of somewhat seriously seriously uh, not somewhat very seriously um but i, I had, a, had a question about some um, sort of repairs you, you touched on there i've sort of spoken to friends who i mean a, a friend who sort of gets on top of these sort of strata sort of things he, he owns a strata and he sort of he was able to have his strata pay for a repair that i thought would have been would have been a he they, they said it was on common property and i said but that's not like, it was like a shower sort of thing and i said so but I suppose my question is there, is there a way that you can find out um, and, and challenge um, and sort of not make sure I pay for it, but how do you sort of do <laughs> investigation on what, what's yeah. your really versus the strategy from Chile? Really, really great point. Um, <clears throat> I see this happen a lot as well, that people don't understand where their responsibility ends and the owner's corporation starts. Um, mm. And common property actually probably extends much further than you think. When you're mm. in your apartment, it's basically only the the surface of what you can see and then within that airspace, that belongs to you. The minute you scratch the surface, then you're impacting the common property. And this is really important in bathrooms because uh, assuming the tiles are original tiles, then the tiles themselves are common property and everything that's below them, the waterproof membrane, the concrete slab, that is all common property. And perhaps where your friend was coming from with having a problem with the bathroom, the shower, I think you said, was because yeah, yeah, yeah. there was a, a leaking uh, waterproof membrane and very, very yeah. common in our older buildings. And then it leaks out and suddenly your, your built-in wardrobe has got mushrooms growing in it because your shower's leaking. Um, yes, that is an owner's corporation responsibility and they will pay. And when we're talking about a waterproof membrane pr problem, how do you fix that? You've got to rip everything up. You got to rip everything yeah. up so you don't just get a new membrane you get some new tiles too because they have to fix the common property and reinstate it to how cool. it should be what about the um let's just say the flow and effects the downstairs kitchen's been is that i mean i know we, we, we don't want to provide advice here because every situation is different oh I've had, these are the questions i answer all day every day yep yeah Happy because the flow and effects though that um that may or may not sort of who who, who foots the bill or who generally foots the bill for those yeah, so any consequential damage. So where common property, there's a defect in common property like this leaking shower, then any consequential damage from that leak is the owner's corporation's responsibility. So another very good, very common example, the leak does go down to the property uh, underneath. And that is often the first time that we realize there's a leak because the shower's working fine, but the water is, mm. there's no waterproof membrane. It's coming through and somebody's getting a puddle in their ceiling downstairs and says, hang on a sec. Uh, and, the, and it could, in some buildings, it gets so bad that there actually ends up being a flood. And so it's the roof, it's their uh, wardrobe, it's their carpet. And if mm. that problem started on the common property and is because of a defect in the common property, then the owner's corporation is responsible for fixing the lot and paying for it. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, because currently with, I mean, the strata that I'm familiar, familiar with is the one I'm in. And um, when I looked at, when I was buying the property, I saw that we needed to pay $33,000 for uh, someone else's kitchen that they just recently renovated. But when they ripped out the renovation, it was just concrete cancer throughout the thing because the, the thing had been leaking, like the um, their sink had been leaking. Mm. So mm. I thought, well, that's weird. Why are we paying? Well, it wasn't we when we bought it, but when we were buying it. But I thought, why is it it's weird? You have a leaking shower, like a leaking tap in your kitchen. Why, why is the rest of the building paying for that? Um, yeah. 
that so there are some intricacies in that yeah. example because you've got to think about the cause of the damage. Mm. And you've just said that that was a renovated kitchen. So the minute we're renovating, we're renovating a bathroom, a kitchen, then we're interfering with the common property. And these principles are not as straightforward. So yeah. a renovated kitchen, the, there should have been, whether there was or not, but there should have been an approval for that kitchen. And as part of that approval, there should have been a requirement that the owner take responsibility for their new kitchen and for any common property that is affected by their new mm. kitchen. Okay. Yeah. Now, if that was in place, and I always recommend that's done in a bylaw because the bylaw is registered and it runs with the land mm -hmm. and we don't forget about it. We can easily find it if we have to. Um, then if it was their fault, their kitchen's fault, a defect in their kitchen, their sink, then it would be easy for the owners corporation to say, oh, well, hang on a sec. Back in 2017, we handed all responsibility for this over to you. It's your renovation. You are responsible for this consequential damage to the slab, which is common property, but it's been damaged because of your renovation, not because of anything that we, the owners corporation did wrong. So there's our nuances there. So yeah, thanks for letting us know about that. Now you have to fix it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm interested to dig into. I, I mean, it's times absolutely flown. We should um, we should dig into that that case study study in Tamar Tamar Tamarama. 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 That's a much better name. I think Tamarama. That's what there's there's two suburbs that are similar to. Yeah, well, you know, we we locals call it Glamarama. Glamarama. Oh, yeah. Kind of, yeah. very, very prestigious, very prestigious uh, Sydney Beaches uh, location. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got, uh, absolutely. Really Glamorama. Fantastic waves at Glamorama. We actually have a great question that's come in from Aaron. I know we, we save questions to the end, but um, not today. Yeah, hey, Amanda, thanks for your insights. Are there any difference between the differences in definition of common property in apartments versus townhouses and villas. Does less parts of the building typically fall under common property in townhouse and villas? Oh, Thanks, Aaron. Does it depend on Great the question. state or territory? Very, very well, good I'm, question. I'm going to ask the lawyer, mate. So I, I want to know from... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I will answer from my perspective as a New South Wales lawyer. It's an excellent question. The starting place for working out what is common property and what is lot property is the strata plan. Okay, so the actual document that is the plan that has the lines on it and has the boxes, the plan that the surveyor drew. This is a registered document. You can always get your hands on it. Your strata manager should have it. If not, you can go to land registry services and you can get a copy of it. The strata plan will have thick black lines on it and we call those boundary lines and those are showing you the common property walls and the common property boundaries in a strata plan. So everything that's um, enclosed within those walls is lot property. This is very generally speaking, let me tell you. Uh, and those black lines are common property. Um, and we read a strata plan with reference to the legislation, the legislation that tells us how to define common property. And that legislation is the Strata Schemes Development Act. And that tells us that anything internal to those lines is lot property um, and anything on those lines and outwards is common property. So you, the starting point is the strata plan. You're absolutely right that strata plans for townhouse developments will be built, uh, will be drawn differently for obvious reasons, quite a different structure. Um, the legislation also talks about the, um, the vertical boundaries and it's very clear that the um, boundary of the floor, you, you own anything from the surface up in your airspace and from the surface of the ceiling down in your airspace. So you won't see that drawn on a plan, but that's what the legislation says. You need to look at any notations on the plan. And in townhouse developments, there's often a notation on the plan that says, notwithstanding these lines and notwithstanding what it says in the legislation, um, each owner's structure of their townhouse is their own responsibility and it is not common property. So um, I, I've, I've learned through my members over the last few years that some of them call those cubic plans or cubic developments. I've, I haven't come across that myself as a lawyer, um, but that is, that is the importance of the strata plan and reading the notations on the strata plan to understand the boundaries of common property. So many, so many intricacies to it. Uh, I mean, that's yeah, that's that's sort of really, um, really interesting. And, and 
and and probably the, a lot of people don't always go to this go to the detail when when buying a property. They don't necessarily look at the strata plan, which they, which they probably should to sort of understand any sort of any hidden sort of gotchas. Yeah, did, especially did, if you have a, a townhouse development where you've bought a townhouse down down one end of a, and somebody else has a problem with their roof, but they're down the other end of the development, and you don't have this plan. notation on the plan, and there's yeah, all the thick black wild. lines. Your response, you're the owners' corporation of which you're a member and you contribute to the fund, has to pay to fix their roof, and that is a hard pill for some people to swallow. You know, some people yeah. think, oh well, their roof gets fixed today, mine gets fixed well, next yeah. week. Not everybody thinks that way. <laughs> Not everyone thinks that way. <laughs> is it? Is it? Do they do these type of buildings? Like my building is uh, uh, three levels of four buildings on each thing, and then we've got another building exactly the same. Are they just doing it to save money on strata? Is that the whole thing? So they can just have one strata manager managing all twenty six units? Then. <laughs> There are, there are increasingly complex ways of building these developments. Um, what I find interesting is commercial and, and residential together, which used to be a single strata plan where you might have had retail down the bottom and then residential up the top. And mm. then we finally up got ones housing. that that, yeah, that just created so many problems with noise and smells and renovations. And now what they do um, with new developments is actually create two strata plans. So you can have as much as you can have many buildings with the same strata plan as you've got, Joe, you can have a single building with two strata plans. So then you have two owners <laughs> corporations and two sets of bylaws and the residents wow. above can have no say in what the commercial or retail is doing down below. Ooh. That's, that's mm. probably something you want to look out for as well to sort of see what the, what the commercial, where you're buying mixed, mixed use kind of property. Because you get, so you do you see, um, the, the, are there many opportunities out there? I, I used to hear this a lot where someone would buy a block of, of units or townhouses that wasn't strata titled, that was just on one title, and then they would subdivide and split the title and then have individual titles and sell off the properties as an individual. Do you see a lot of that nowadays or not so much? I, or I don't a see a lot of that. I do in um, in the eastern suburbs in, say, Wallara, in Elizabeth Bay, in Point Piper, you see a lot of the older mansions, you know, older houses, gorgeous houses that have been strata titled that way. Mm. Um, generally 80s, the strata titling was done in the 80s and they've ended up with three or four apartments, um, strata apartments in these old houses. Um and I work a lot with those ones because they're the ones that tend to have repair and maintenance issues just because of their age. And when you've got two, three, four owners, um, I often say, and we can get into this, the smallest buildings have the biggest problems because disputes are very hard to resolve when you've only got a, a few voices and some Poor big people. personalities. Yeah. 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 And how does it work? Is it just majority rules or is there a, um, a system where it's like you get 10 votes, I get one vote, or is it just sure, one? You do that, right? The answer then... to that is both. <laughs> it works both of those ways. So um, when we're talking about repair and maintenance decisions, those decisions are made um, at a general meeting by and what we call an ordinary resolution. So that is a majority vote. Uh, however, each uh, apartment will have what we call a unit entitlement. So this is a, a number that's allocated to them, often out of 1,000 or out of 10,000. Um, they might have, um, if it's 1,000, they might have a unit entitlement of 250. And then oh. every apartment, it's a four-lot scheme. Each apartment has 250 unit entitlement. And then the voting can be based on a unit entitlement or it can be based on a show of hands. Um, and a, an owner can request if they want to vote to be based on a unit entitlement. Where I see a lot of problems is where the unit entitlements are not equal in a three or four lot scheme. So maybe two owners out of four have the capacity to stop um, decisions, ordinary resolutions, decisions by majority vote by simply demanding that the vote be calculated on a unit entitlement basis. And so then they have 
the power to determine the vote. So another thing to be really careful of buying into strata is have a look at those, we call them schedules of unit entitlement. It's on the title, you'll see it on the title. What is your unit entitlement and what does that mean for your vote? It's really only relevant in smaller schemes or most, most relevant in smaller schemes. Is it possible that your neighbours can block decisions or stop decision making if you don't agree? It sounds tough. Sounds, uh, sounds potentially um, sort of a, a make or break in terms of an investment property if you can't sort of make any decisions in, 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 in your building. So yep. we, we, we'll have to talk about Tem Temarama because I think I got it. I don't know. That, I looked at it. I Googled it, man. That's what it looks nice. like. Temarama. <laughs> I promise. I promise it's called Tamarama. Okay. Well, I'm, yeah, I'm actually pretty excited about this one because, um, you know, I don't want to give it away, but they, they got a loan, a strata loan, which is apparently a thing, and then created something amazing, which automatically paid off the strata loan and created sensational value. Um, so before we jump into that, let's jump into the next sponsor and then we'll be free to go wild about this one. It talks about yeah, negotiation of strata. Selling a property. It isn't something we do every single day. There's actually more involved in the process than you may initially think. Like, how do you find the best agent? How do you ensure that you're going to pay the lowest fees? It's not easy. And then also throw in all the stress and pressure of selling. And that's why Scott Agger, a former real estate agent and expert property negotiator from Hello House, has created his leading agent finder service. After a 20-year career managing agents himself, Scott has personally conducted over 3,000 property transactions along with running Three Bell franchises. He knows all these agent tricks. Scott has created an in-depth five-step process for his leading agent finder service. First, he establishes the true market value for your property, he uses a triangulation method to shortlist the leading agents, creates a competitive environment for those agents to send through their best proposals, vets those proposals, and then he negotiates the best agent fees for you. This ensures that you're not only getting the best rate for selling, but most importantly, you have a leading agent on your side selling your property to maximize the end sale value. Oh, and did I mention, this service is completely free. If you'd like to know exactly how Scott runs his five-step leading agent finder service, he's detailed it with the link below. Or if you'd like to speak with Scott to help find you the leading agent in your area, book a call today. There you go. Impressive. Did you find out all about the building uh, during the uh, during Scott's ad, Joe? Are you now hey, I know all about this building. This is a fantastic Tamarama uh, building <laughs> enterprise that's been going on. Um, yeah. But I think Amanda knows the, the most about it. So um, give us the rundown. Yeah. So what what is okay. this? Uh, what is this building? What's it about? And how does it work? Well, this building was one of Sydney's ugliest buildings. Can, so can I would photo? love to know. Oh, I don't know if uh, I can. Uh, Joe might be able to. I'll have a look. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Yeah, Try yeah. and find a before. Try and find a before yeah. photo, Joe. Um, and I'd love to know if, you, if any of your viewers here are familiar with um, the, the Tamarama Toaster, it has been called. Um, it's actually, oh, yeah. uh, it's, its name was uh, Glen, Glenview, someone will tell me if I'm wrong, Glenview Court, um, been renamed now to something far more glamorous. Um, but it's a building mm. in the brutalist style, so 19... 60s architecture. It was apparently designed by Harry Seidler, interestingly, um, and went through a few developers. It ended up being developed by, by a Rivkin, not the Rivkin, I think the son of the Rivkin. Oh. Uh, seven stories, 81 dwellings, a mix of one, two, and three bedrooms, some with parking, but not everybody had parking, and a single Passenger lift. Yeah, that's a before. Yep. So this is a before. I Because I always yep. used to see this building and I was like, why did they put a prison <gasps> at yes. the top of at the yeah. top of Tamarama? Like this is the oh, view. There you go. So There's we, the view. That is the view of the wonderful Tamarama Beach, which is fantastic for leisure activities. And then you've got a prison just here. Um, yep. I don't know why they've done it. <laughs> so unimpeded panoramic views from each of those east side apartments. You're looking out to Tamarami, you're looking out to the Pacific Ocean. And this building was incredibly run down. And, you know, when you read some articles from residents who were living there years ago, they'd say some, some of the apartments had squatters in them. I mean, I just don't understand how that happens. Um, but an yeah. incredibly 
rundown building. Now, what happened is in uh, about 2009, there were two fire orders issued by the local council. So one of the orders related to concrete cancer. So I've already mentioned that a big, big deal to get rid of concrete cancer. And many of these beachside apartment buildings have concrete cancer. Uh, council ordered that concrete cancer be removed. Uh, also orders about fire doors and stairs and landings and balustrades. So this community, this owners corporation needed to find the money to fix these problems. And this was going to be multiple millions of dollars. But they were one of these communities I was talking about earlier, amazingly, because it's a big, big building uh, in relative terms. They were one of these communities that could get together and make a decision to not take the cheap, the just multiple, a few million dollars, not the cheap option and just fix the problems. But they decided to use this as an opportunity to add value and to make some real money for their building. So they got together, they had to pass a few resolutions and there's a, a legal process around all of this. But in essence, you require a 75% approval. So 75% of the owners to agree to do this level of refurbishment and um, renovation to an apartment building. So they it took them till about 2012, 2013, they lodged a DA. And a big part of the DA was to build two penthouses on the roof. So we were going to build two completely new dwellings on that roof. Oh, I had yep. a picture. Yeah, here we go. So this is what we're looking, this is more to what today looks like. Uh, yeah. Adding balconies. So it's a bit hard to see, but those balconies were not there before. We just had that very sharp, brutalist, that was the prison, the brutalist facade, no balconies in prison. prison. There you go. Flat. Yep. <laughs> so add balconies to that side. They're actually on the western side. They've added walkways. So they've extended the, um, the apartments on the western side as well. New ah, lift towers. Yeah. And importantly for this area of Sydney, they have added two levels of underground parking. So everybody Ooh. now has parking where they didn't previously. Uh, and they've also done their work that the council ordered them to do by the fire order. They've done their fire work and their concrete remedial sprinklers. work. Sprinklers. Cut yep. the sprinklers yes. in. <laughs> All the sprinklers are rather controversial. We can, we can get to that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and what they did was they needed uh, money to do this work, of course, and they borrowed that money. Uh, ultimately, it was about $40 million at the end of the day, borrowed that money using a strata loan. Now, strata loans are unique financial products. There's only a couple of providers in the market. The big banks um, don't, Macquarie Bank does, but the other banks don't provide strata loans. And these are unsecured loans. There's no mortgage. There's no application or assessment process for owners to go through. So they're actually kind of easy to get as long as the lender understands what the money is used for. Um, and we can talk about, if you like, how, they, um, how they're secured. But because an owner's corporation is, is an owner's corporation, then the, um, the strata loan doesn't have to be secured by way of a registered mortgage. So over a number of years, this project has been carried out. The strata loan has funded the project. It is now, it was completed towards the end of last year. And it is now known as Australia's largest strata asset renewal project. And it really is that shining light example. Uh, we were talking about it in my strata lawyers conference today about just what can be achieved when you have a community on board and the, and the whole project was led by a chairperson, chairperson Christine, um, who just had so much energy. And she, she spoke today and she said, I nearly quit that so many times, but I just hung on there because I really believed in this project. Um, ultimately, all of this work has increased the floor space of each unit by 25%. And wow. the expectation is a few, the units are going on the market now. On my research, some have been, have been sold over the last few years during the course of the project. Um, but the value is expected to increase by minimum um, 75% is what I think they've reported, Ooh, they're reporting wow. on their website. Um, and remember, we're talking about adding parking, we're adding balconies, we're adding space. Uh, there's a lo lovely new foyer and all set up for, for luxury apartment living with concierge and all of that stuff. Um, 
and this is the thing we've got this 40 million dollar strata loan okay we've been just paying the the interest on that as we need to yeah we're gonna what, what sell. is the interest rate what's the interest rate on a strata loan is it just it's like 10 percent or 20 or something? Unsecured, eight or so. nine percent it's eight or nine percent it's high because of the nature of it being unsecured yeah mm -hmm. um if you're thinking though as investors and thinking about tax deductibility and all of that, um, when you do your numbers, you you might find, and this is a, a, another chat to have, um, the best way to raise money in an owner's corporation, special levy, strata loan, cash. Um, strata loans sometimes work out better for investors depending on your tax position. Um, so these two penthouses, they're going to sell yeah. these two penthouses and they're priced at 20 million plus each and that's going to pay out. The strata loan. Million. And they're incredibly well placed in the market right now that I think their results are better than they have ever uh, intended or hoped that they would be. Yeah. Yeah. How, How good, good is that? that? Jackie Henderson might go <laughs> And I know um, talking about it today and talking to the, the lender who, who organised this, um, the funding for them, he was saying that he's got another five projects on his books and these are people uh, in the eastern suburbs who've been inspired by watching this development and wanting to bring those results to their own communities. It's Ooh. sensational because all of a sudden you've said, you know what, we need $40 million. We'll create two penthouses on the top, which is going to pay for absolutely everything. It's going to give you 25% extra. It's going to give you an extra car space and the value of your property is going to be worth uh, two, like $2 million. I was looking at the recent sold as, as far back as I could before it went mm. into the millions. And uh, in 2013, a unit was sold for $500,000 um, in that complex. So, right. Yeah, one point five two million dollars now. So they've quadrupled their money in a matter of years. And with limited yeah. outlay, that's the thing. Um, no, you nothing, know, you're, yeah. you're developing property and you're having to fund that and you're having to pay every penny. Um, there's some outlay there with having to pay the interest on the loan. Um, but in the scheme of things, very, very limited for those kinds of results at the end of the day. Can, can I, can I, from a from a risk management? I mean, I, I know you you may not be able to talk to this, but what, what sort of risk would there be in in this type of arrangement? I mean, so I, mean, I suppose your liability. Yes, I suppose um, I would be thinking if I put myself in the position of that building, uh, and I can talk quite openly about it because I haven't been involved um, in a legal capacity, just watching what's going on from the outside. Um, I'd be worried about time. Um, because I'd be worried about construction delays. I'd be worried about um, interventions by council and getting everything signed off. Um, ultimately, if you if you Google the, the property now, you'll see that there was in December some intervention by our building commissioner, David Chandler, that has delayed some things. Um, if I was, if I had to be in there or I had to be selling it or I had to have my tenants in there, um, I'd be concerned about the potential for the time to blow out and that I would have no control over that. Unlike if I was the owner of a freestanding property and I, it was my contract with the builder and I could jump up and down and threaten litigation. Um, if I'm just a member of the owner's corporation, I'm kind of sitting back and unable to control that. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the biggest project that's ever been done in Australia. Yes, Australia. in terms of a yeah a, a strata in renewal strata. project, we call it a renewal or redevelopment. Um, yes, and I I believe um, uh, it may well be the largest loan, the largest loan as well that um, has been done through Lanark Strata Finance. Yeah, are there any other kind of projects like bigger? But not as big as that one. Well, obviously, the biggest um, that you've heard of that are that are rather interesting. I know there are a few going on. Uh, just a few that I heard about today um, uh, around again eastern suburbs, Bondi, Waverley. Uh, I had a client who was in Vaucluse who was very inspired by this uh, project and was looking into how they could replicate that. Again, a big big building uh, on the cliff face. Um, I haven't heard recently how that's going. Um, this is where time comes into it. And I think if you have to be, you have to be aware, you have to be going into these projects knowing that it's not going to be your usual um, quick flip if that's what people are into. Um, mm. There's commitment, there's dedication, there's keeping a heck of a lot of people happy and making sure that yeah. you are 
answering their questions before they're even asked. Um, you know, mm. we were saying today that at the the meeting where the uh, the proposal was put for Tamarama, um, the committee had informed people so well and answered so many questions and made the proposal so clear that the only question at the meeting was from an owner who said, so where does the washing machine go in the new apartment? <laughs> And oh, that's just so gold, that. you know. That is that is an impeccably planned project, um, and it hasn't been, I, I'm sure, without its blood, sweat, and tears. Um, yeah. But they're they're long term, long term commitments. So I often have clients who come to me at the first stage. How do we do it? And I sort of explain this to them how it's done, um, and then I don't hear from them for a couple of years while they're in the trenches and getting quotes and going through council and um, trying to get all those boxes ticked. Yeah. How how long was this one? This was this project, 2012, sorry. they got the DA. 2012, they got the DA. So that's 10 years. 10 years. Of yeah. Yeah. And properties have been the, bought the, and sold in that time and, and increased, mm. of course, increased in value just because this was happening. Market. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I saw a number sold 14, 15, 16, like 2013 is where they stopped selling for under a million and they just kept mm. going and going and going. And that one, that's, yeah, fantastic. So there must be an opportunity then for extending you know, these these buildings that, that aren't at that legal height, right? If the legal height is four stories and your property oh, yeah. only has two stories and you can just throw another extra one on top there because, I mean, material is getting a lot, light, a, a lot more lightweight. Um, it's becoming slightly easier potentially to be able to do those type of things. So there's an opportunity on those types. As well. Yeah. So older buildings, always older buildings um, for a number of reasons. Um, I, I've said, encourage people to look, I don't give investment advice, of course, uh, but myself and uh, others around me to invest in older buildings. I used to say 10 years. I used to say at least 10 years out of that building defects <laughs> period under our legislation. But tell you what, uh, mascot towers was 10 years old and that has scared uh, a lot of us um so i say 20 20 years now at least 20 years old um and, <laughs> and then it'll be 21 sweet... next year and <laughs> 22 well i think after. yeah one of your um one of your group members i think was asking about uh you know building defects and when does it stop and is it getting better and what you know what is our building commissioner david chandler actually doing um and i think what he's doing is <laughs> um there is some new law yes but what the new law does is make developers accountable what what it doesn't put any new standards it doesn't change the quality of the builds or not intentionally change the quality of the builds but it makes them accountable so they actually do the right thing and, and that they can't actually start selling until they have, or they can't get their occupation certificate and start settling their sales until they've fixed the problems. So that's what he's doing. It's it's good for the buildings that are coming off now, but that's why I wouldn't be buying anything um, less than twenty years uh, less than twenty years old because those buildings have not had those checks, um, and you can still have major problems in those buildings. Yeah. So what um, happened? What, what, like, is the, is there a year, like, obviously you're saying 20 years, like what happened and what has happened to those buildings and what should we look out for? Cause you're scaring me here. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, it is scary. Um, the, a number of things happened, um, but probably when people are asked, those in the industry are asked this question, most of us talk about um, private certification. So when councils, stopped having to go in and check the quality of what had been done in the building and issue certificates and when the developer could appoint their own certifier to do that work um, that is when we started to see um, box ticking uh, certificates being handed out where properties had not actually been checked and certain developers not all there's some very good developers out there certain developers um just taking advantage of that process and not producing quality construction so then can we go back to those building certifiers and get our money back because opal towers is you know falling apart it's not that easy is it not anymore because you only have a then you only had a 
six or seven year warranty period. So once you're out of the warranty, two things, once you're out of the warranty period, there's no recourse. Um, laws are changing a little bit there to make that 10 years now. Um, and also those developers were not around. So the practice of phoenixing these companies, so winding up these companies, just uh, establishing them for the sole purpose of constructing this one development and then winding them up. So there was actually nobody there to sue. Um, the other big problem was, uh, and still is, with homeowners warranty insurance, where there is an exemption for developers. They don't have to have homeowners warranty insurance if they're building multi-storey developments. So um, don't quote me, it's three or four stories. If you're three or four stories or more in New South Wales, then you don't actually have to have homeowners warranty insurance, which means if you, as a developer, die, disappear or become insolvent, then the owners have no recourse, nowhere to go. They have to pay to fix the problems. And so many owners' corporations have ended up in that pain. And that is why when I did conveyancing years ago, I had my template letter. If someone was going to buy off the plan, my template letter would say, do not buy this property. That's my advice. Do not buy this property. Of course, no one <laughs> would listen and they would sign the Professional contract. Professional legal advice, do not buy. Yes, yes. <laughs> But people fall in love and um, believe and what they want to believe and go ahead and, and sign that contract and deal with the fallout. Yeah, yeah, it's, um, yeah there's been some been some interesting sort of uh, situations play out, mostly in, I was going to say Sydney, but I'm sure they're all around the country, unfortunately. Um, it's just probably just hear about it more because I, I think in Can Canberra is potentially an interesting sort of, situation as well you don't hear necessarily i mean i don't hear a lot about it but knowing people down that way you sort of hear there have been some issues with building quality um in in the act or, or canberra as well um, on the, some of those newer yeah i think it's fairly endemic unfortunately or, or has been um but yes we have our building commissioner in new south wales who's trying to improve that so we should have some yeah. quality construction coming through now which is a good thing yeah, mm. definitely. So buy a 2022 and beyond and you'll be you'll be all right. Exactly, as long as it doesn't yeah. have a lift pool or a gym. <laughs> Age to the yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> should we uh we're at, we're at an hour and a half. I just uh, at times obviously thrown. Should we should we throw to some QA? There were some I mean Maroni and uh Luke and Luke and Hayden are, are blowing up the comments. Um, they, they, they love doing that. But um, should we um, should we should we talk to some of the? Do you want to pick one of the questions from the pre? Uh, not pre. Do you want to pick a question? Well, I got a question from one of the guys, um, old Rodney Rodney Holder. I'm buying a oh, block yeah. of units, four okay. times three bed, one bath. They've already been strata titled, but there is nobody corporate, no sinking fund. Anything I need to look at for pitfalls? Got your advice? Thanks. Oh, you even commented on it. Oh, oh, you, you I did. asked Rodney. Yeah, I asked Rodney what state he was in, just so I could be prepared. Um, mm -hmm. Because the, in, in terms of new developments, the situation is a little bit different in New South Wales than it is in Queensland. Um, but I'll do my best just to provide some some general tips, which I think actually apply across the board. Um, Rodney, I'm wondering what you plan to do with this property, whether you are holding this block and you're going to put tenants in there or whether you're planning to renovate and sell uh, all or only sell some. So that would be the first thing to be thinking about. I'm sure you're, you're already across that. Um, and then you say that there, it's been strata titled uh, and you're in Queensland. You say it's been strata titled, but there's no body corporate. Um, I hear that all the time. I hear that all the time with especially with two lot schemes oh it's strata but there's no there's no owners corporation well that kind of is not a thing if it's been strata titled if there's a strata plan then the owners corporation or the body corporate is constituted on registration of the plan so there is a body corporate but what you're saying is they've never actually done anything they haven't followed any of the rules they don't have meetings they don't have funds um it's not an active uh, and compliant body corporate now if the building has been in the single ownership of the developer. I'm not sure if this is a new building, if it's a new building and you're buying the building straight from the developer, who we might call the original owner, then there's even though there's been a body corporate, there's been no requirement to set up all of these things because the developer, the original owner, still owns all of the lots. And these are the rules in New South Wales and in Queensland that until you start selling off 
some of the lots, then you don't actually have to have a meeting, you don't have to raise levies, you don't have to um, have a fund. Um, what your situation, Rodney, is you're buying all of them. So if you're buying from the original owner, then immediately you're triggering that obligation to hold the first annual general meeting. And under Queensland law, there are certain things that you must do at that meeting. So you have to have motions to set up your funds. You have to have motions to set a budget. Um, the original owner who you're buying from has to hand over particular documents to you. So you really do need to be talking to a Queensland Strata lawyer. And if you need some names, I'm happy to let you know the guys up there. Um, and just make sure that you're across all of that. There should be a, a registered community management statement already that has a set of bylaws that you can have a look at. Um, and all of this could be by the by if this person is not the original owner and they've already bought it from the developer. So then I'd be asking, well, why aren't they having meetings? Why haven't they done all of these things? Because they have a legal obligation to do it. And what if it's what if it's a new, uh, an old property? Is that the same situation? Yeah, what I'm thinking, if it's an old property, then it may have changed hands a number of times and maybe Rodney's just buying it all in one line now as uh, the opportunity yeah. has arisen, then I, I would be especially concerned about somebody, an agent or the vendor telling me that, oh, it's strata title, but there's no body corporate um, because that means there's been non-compliance there for a number of years. Um Again, it may not matter. Rodney's buying it. He's going to be the only owner. He doesn't have anyone else to, to convince or um, to involve in decision making. But if he's planning to on sell, and I'm seeing some of the comments here, Rodney's planning to make some money, um, then he needs to get all of this in line. And getting the help of a body corporate lawyer, a strata lawyer in Queensland um, is going to be really important. Yeah, I just know how it goes, Rodney. It sounds like an interesting, an interesting one. <laughs> it sounds like yeah, I'd, I'd need I need a bit more time myself to actually kind of. Sounds like you a lot to unpack there. Um, I mean, there's there's a question about ABMA. We might not ask that one because I, I don't know whether we want to talk about ABMA. Uh, so that's the sweet. Australian Building Managers Association, and I don't have anything to do with the ABMA, save that I know that they exist, um, and they produce some codes of conduct and some textbooks that look. Um, like fairly heavy reading. Um, no, I'm not involved in the ABMA. Okay, cool. Yeah, I was, I was, it was very specific, that one, so I thought oh, I sometimes... Too, There's I'm a lot of acronyms in Strata. Let, I hope well, I know most of it. Um, this is an interesting one because a lot of people talk about managing your own properties and, I mean, this is next level, like self-managing your own Strata. What are, what are your thoughts or what are your members in your, in your group? Yeah. Yeah, great question. I've got some amazing members in my community who do this and I'm in awe of them, okay? I'll tell you why, because I could never do it and I would never do it. Um, it, it, is, it depends on the size of the building, of course, depends on you might own half the building, you might own three quarters, so it makes sense to you. Um, anything that's more than four lots, I would think is going to have some level of complexity that I wouldn't have the time or inclination to get involved in. Um, strata managers are not expensive uh, in my experience and in my view, relative to strata lawyers, I think. Uh, they could certainly charge more for the valuable work that they do. So um, I get concerned when I hear people worry about costs. Um, there's definitely a benefit in having a professional guide if a problem comes up. If you if you have a difficult owner who says we need to fix this, then strata managers, whilst they're not lawyers, they do have a basic knowledge of the strata law and should be able to say, yes, it's your responsibility. No, it's not. Having formal meetings, uh, I'm a big advocate for always having committee meetings in accordance with the legislation, issuing notices of meeting, issuing minutes of meeting notices and minutes of general meetings. Your strata manager is going to do all of that and you don't have to worry about it. Um, the buildings I see self-managed well through um, that I see owners in my community do, um, I think they're often retirees who have the time to be able to take on this role um, and have a, a passion for it. They're owner occupiers, so they're there. Um, and they can see what's going on in the building and be that point of contact. Um, 
and they're very, very engaged in keeping up to date on the strata legislation, um, making sure that they're across what they, they need to be doing and very responsive to owners' problems. Um, I just could not... I could not be that person. And and another thing, you know, going back to what I might look for investing in strata, I would always look for a strata managed property. So if you're looking at um, how your purchases are going to see the property, self-managed and, you know, it gets a little bit more sophisticated these days, but it used to be the shoebox. The chairperson had the shoebox under his bed of receipts and you'd go to inspect the records and he'd go, there you go. You think, oh, okay, no, don't think I want to be involved in that community. So I don't know if those are pros and cons, but <laughs> I think yeah, I think you can sort of yeah, you can you can put put a couple on one side, a couple on the other side. Um, yeah, that's um, it's that's, just that's like great. it's just like when people say I do my own property management. It's like, well, you could, but should you? No. Yeah. I mean, no, I, I, no. Could, I could cut my hair, though, but I ended up with a horrible haircut. Probably. I mean. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was COVID proved that for most of us. Um, yeah. Uh, so my, yeah, I, I like that. What, what, we got another question here. I have a question about units under community titles and building insurance for them. Very confusing. Estrada needs to have it. Uh, very confusing. Estrada needs to have insurance and owner. I'm not sure that's the question, is it? So. Um, <laughs> I have the, a question without asking the question. The owner's corporation has to have building insurance. Uh, and you've mentioned their community title. We do have community title schemes in New South Wales, more common in that term is more common in Queensland. Um, but yes, community title schemes have to have building insurance as well. Um, and then as if you're an owner occupier, you would then have contents insurance for your contents as your tenants have contents insurance. And if you're a landlord, you have, um, if you want to have landlord insurance. Um, so you don't need to have if, if your question is, do we need two sets of building insurance? No, your owner's corporation building insurance is sufficient and they're quite broad, quite generous policies. Mm -hmm. I'm always surprised at what owner's corporation insurers cover. Um, getting more and more expensive, though, I think there was another question about premiums um, a, a group member had asked. Um, yes, everybody's premiums going up and it's really, really hard to get for some buildings to even get more than one quote. Um, there's a real problem with the strata insurance sector at the moment. This is probably something you might not be able to answer, but can give some high level snapshot. Do owners yes. pay tax on anything that is income to the owner occupier? Oh, yeah. is that so, owner occupier or owner's owner's corporation? Owner's corporation. income to the owner's corporation? Yeah. So good question. Uh, I, I'm not giving tax advice, but I can try and give a general guideline. I've spoken about this on, on my own podcast previously. Um, there is a tax ruling, an ATO ruling that says um, income from any income producing activity on the common property is taxed in the hands of the owners. So you do have to Ooh. be really careful if you are Ooh. leasing part Creating of the common property. Uh, if you're going to rent it out, yes. Uh, if in terms of selling it, it's a that's a little bit different if you're subdividing and selling common property because then you're actually selling land and it's not, um, It's a, as I understand it, I was listening to a tax guy talk today actually, as I understand it, that's in a different bracket. Um, but yes, important to be across that. Uh, a lot of buildings, not a lot of buildings, but some buildings lease their common roof space to telecommunications towers. So you might have the um, Vodafone tower or something leasing your space. Um, I believe that is the kind of income that is taxed in the hands of the owners. So anytime you are engaging in a, or deciding whether you should engage in an income producing activity as your owner's corporation, definitely go and get some tax advice. We do have um, specialist strata tax um, accountants who can do that for you. Um, Kelly Partners are really big in that space. Um, so really important to get your own advice. And everybody's situation, once again, is going to be different. So especially if income is taxed in your hands, that might work out well for you, but not well for others. So they're definitely situations that need to be covered off with good communication. Yeah, yeah, that's that's, that's, yeah. That, that's one of the things I'm interested in because you must come, you know, when when I want to start a lawyer, it's because there's stuff's gone down. How do you how do you redeem some of those problems that the miscommunications, the challenges? How do you de-escalate it and bring it back to a a nice calm level playing field? Because 
I could definitely see like our strata, the people in our block are not the greatest to deal with. And I could totally see people just ego, be, boom, be careful, ego. Bro, they might be watching, so you, you, you well, might be escalating right now. You might be escalating. Oh, God. Hell, they just, I'll shut my window. He's looking out the window again. Um, it comes back to people. It comes back to people. And what you need is a really great committee member or owner or just an all-round um, good person, good human being who is prepared to be that advocate, who is prepared to be that circuit breaker, that voice of reason. You're right. I deal with dysfunctional communities most days of my week. And where I see problems resolved or where I make suggestions to resolve them, it's by bringing in or identifying that person who is that great mediator, that circuit breaker, that voice of reason, that trusted uh, um uh, disinterested, which doesn't mean uninterested, just means unbiased and impartial person oh, yeah. who can be, they can be there. We can have a formal mediation session if that's what's going to work and they can be in, involved in that session. Um, you can bring in a professional mediator if things are really that bad. Um, but I see it in communities that on my own communities I've been involved in, there is that person who just, it doesn't matter what the problem is. If this committee member goes and knocks on, the door, on their door and has a chat to them, Everybody opens the door and says, oh, it's so lovely to see you. Oh, is that really going on? But if I went and knocked on the door, I uh, no, that is that would not be a good idea. If Amanda's knocking on the door, that we're not going to solve any problems because that's just not who I am or who I'm seen to be in the community. If we've got legal proceedings on, then yes, they want Amanda there. But if we have to have a conversation to de-escalate, we probably don't want Amanda there. So it's about <laughs> identifying people's strengths and uh, people problems are solved with good people. Mm. Do you see like a lot more problems raised when there are a lot of investors? Um, like there's 20 blocks and 20, you know, there's 20 blocks and 15 are owned by investors. So they're all tenanted. Do you see like, have you seen a, like a complaint, an issue from investors slash owner occupiers? Yes. And I think that's part of the reason why I look at that ratio when I'm mm. choosing whether to buy into Strata. Um, I think with a higher level of um, tenants as opposed to owner occupiers, what you have is high turnover. So you have people moving in and out more often because leases are short. Um, you may still have some short-term letting going on, so you've got even more people moving in and out. Uh, and I see communities that I work with with high levels of tenancies, they have a lot of problem with waste management. Um, their bin rooms are overflowing. They get the mattresses on the common property, the washing machines left when people move in and out. So you don't have, just by nature of the commitment, you don't have uh, that high turnover when you have owner occupiers because people stay in, in place, generally speaking, for a little bit longer. Um, and having more owner occupiers on site also means that you are going to pick up on problems more quickly. So the cleaner's not doing a great job. So Mary in Unit 7 rings the strata manager and says, hey, they were just here. Here's some photos that I took. Can you give them a buzz and make sure they do better next time? If you haven't got owner occupiers there, um, unfortunately, and I'm speaking generally, there's some great tenants, often long-term tenants out there who take the same interest, um, but owner occupiers are there keep, to keep an eye on things and make sure that the standard is maintained, I think is a good thing. Mm. Do you see this becoming bigger and bigger? Like I feel like the way we've gotten density wise in New South Wales and Victoria and, and even in, in Queensland as well, it's getting pretty, it's getting pretty dense up there. This is going to become such a broader issue as we all start to move into these taller towers and um, I don't know, are you seeing that? Do you see that yes. as a possibility in the future? It's already happening. Uh, mm. Strata living is becoming increasingly complex for a few reasons. We're, we're building more complex communities. So I talked about that mix of commercial residential, retail residential. We have large scale communities now. Uh, I think of Jackson's Landing in Piermont in Sydney, Breakfast Point in Sydney. Um, these are big community associations that then have strata buildings that then have 
uh, commercials, uh, commercial facilities shared with residential facilities. So they have building management committees and they each have bylaws and they have strata management statements. And these are all things that just, you know, I don't expect anybody to follow, but to relay the complexity of these developments. Yeah. So that's been happening sort of for the last 20 years or so. Then what we have is increasing property prices and just the, the value of these properties um, increasing exponentially. So the level of um, sophistication of owners and investors is increasing and the importance that they're placing on their investment is increasing. It's not just sort of the set and forget and and maybe I'll just have a tenant in there and, and then I'll put my, my daughter in there when she goes to university. Um, these are now multi-million dollar properties and they are being uh, run essentially yes you've got a professional strata manager but they're being run by a group of volunteers so committee members generally are not paid run by a group of volunteers who may be lucky enough to have a background in law or accounting or have sat on a board of a listed company and may have some knowledge about managing huge budgets because these budgets the bigger the building more complex the, the bigger the budget um, so that's making things more complicated where these people are coming in and saying, well, surely there's a better way to do things. How do we add value to our common property? If I had a freestanding home, I'd be adding value. Why aren't I doing it here? How do we install sustainability, sustainable infrastructure? Um, we've got money. We've got a million dollars sitting in our capital works fund. Can we invest that? So that, that's a new thing that I, I was interviewing a guest on the podcast about that a few weeks ago. Can we invest that in the, in the stock market the same way that I would invest uh, money that I had sitting around the same way my superannuation is invested. Why should it just sit there in a capital works fund getting zero interest and yeah, term deposits? Not offset. Now. So, yeah, so all these questions coming up because your owner is becoming more sophisticated and we're talking about more money. So all of that converging then with more apartments, definitely, more apartments on the market, um, our denser co urban communities. Um, it's It's fun. Yeah. That's uh yeah, yeah. That, that, there's a lot of uh, I I I know you've, it's something you've thought a lot about. So I'm I'm going to throw one last question because we're nearly at two hours and 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 I I'm surprised that we got to, uh, this is an interesting one. It, it may be a bit of a a tougher one, but I'm mean, gonna it's it's an anonymous one that got sent to me and um they, they, I think anonymous. What, sorry, what is I think, it? I think I think somebody will somebody will get about. So I, I just typed it up. This person didn't want to be I suppose identified. <laughs> I have There's three townhouses. In a, yeah, yeah. What friend is this, Jeff? Does he start with Jay and with Miles? I have three townhouses in a block of eight, but the strata insurance cost is extremely high now because of the townhouses in the back block burned down a few years ago. I contacted the strata and checked out the financial report, and yeah, all cost in the assurance. They said they have three quotes, but I don't trust we're getting the lowest rate by a mile. Mm, Jeff Miles, yeah. how do we fix this? Mm. Very good question, not oh Jeff Miles. <laughs> not Jeff um, I mentioned this earlier, insurance premiums, building insurance premiums are going through the roof. So um, I'm not surprised that your strata manager is saying this is the best quote. But if you don't trust them, ask for copies of the other quotes. These are your records. You are entitled. The strata manager owns nothing. The strata manager is your agent. You are the principal. Yeah. So these are your records and every owner is entitled to access the owner's corporation's records. So say, send us copies of the quotes. I'm surprised your strata manager didn't do that. Next thing, yeah. are they using a broker? Are they using an insurance broker? We have uh, a lot yeah. of great strata insurance brokers. Um, so has the broker been involved in trying to get a good deal for you? And you can always change brokers as well if you feel like the broker isn't doing a great job. Um, so definitely find out what the quotes are so you can be assured that you are getting the cheapest. And if there are insurers who some people can only get one quote, I said earlier, often the incumbent insurer is the only one who will quote. Um, I then say, well, go and ask those other insurers who decline to quote why they declined to quote and what can we do to improve our record so that we could get quotes in the future? Is it just a matter of time? And it might just be a matter of time having to pass since that unfortunate event. Um, and you might just be limited with your options until then. Yeah. It, it, it even, is this the kind of thing that if they can't resolve it because it sort of sounds, I mean, the, the person elaborated a bit further to me, um, is, it, is this sort of thing that you potentially would um, become a, they could be a client of yours, maybe. Is that sort of 
Are these things you would help out with? Or, like this or is someone would knock on your door for this. Yes, yeah. it would depend. If uh, I definitely work with communities that uh, are unhappy with their strata manager and they want to get out of their contracts or they want to change strata managers. Uh, I work with communities that, uh, that or work with owners in communities where they feel their building is not meeting its legal obligations in any particular way. So the building's not insured, for example. That's that's a no-no. So we'd go to the tribunal and get an order that there be insurance. Um there is uh, a provision in our legislation that says if a community is not functioning satisfactorily in any number of different ways, the tribunal can actually appoint an administrator to carry out all functions of the owner's corporation. So the strata manager gets removed, but all decision-making powers of the owners and of the committee gets removed as well for a period of time, usually 12 months to two years. And that's when we see... Um, the 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 most difficult communities really in trouble, not able to make a decision to comply with their legal obligations, not meeting their repair and maintenance duties, um, maybe not having meetings, maybe not striking levies, then the tribunal will intervene and appoint an administrator who is a professional strata manager um, to do all of those things without any input from the owners. So that's when things get really bad. So I do a lot of that stuff. Now that's um thanks thanks for giving us that overview. That's that's a really sort of very clear and concise of, of what a strata lawyer does. And I'm s i am I think we sort of it, it's a nice kind of uh, a, a circular like we've come full circle. We've sort of uh, asked what they do and we've sort of finished almost with that, I think. So yeah, I think we'll <laughs> people are still asking questions, but I think we have to respect the man time because he's given way more than what I thought um being able to give you been a conference all day. So thank you. Anyway. Yeah, I appreciate you taking all the time to cover this off. And what I love most is that you haven't, like, you've made Strata fun. Like, this is actually interesting Interesting now, right? It's creative. It's not just a... <laughs> super. super Strata superhero. Of like course, yeah. You There's called so it. much opportunity here. Yeah. There really is, yeah. And I yeah, I spend some time whenever I have these kinds of chats talking about some 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 downers and some scary bits and some, oh, be careful of that. But I always like to make sure that at the end of a conversation I say, you know, I, I invest in Strata, I live in Strata uh, from time to time, depending on where I'm at and which part of the world. Um, and I think it is a, a, a wonderful uh, investment, uh, has been for me, choosing the right community um, as best you can. It's not an exact science and you don't know everything from looking at books and records, but I really think choosing, uh, looking at those personalities that you can see operating in the building is, is really should be your foundation piece for choosing a good building. Um, and I love the community that, that comes from um, being part of a strata committee, being part of a, a strata building um, and achieving, achieving those value add projects, big or small, um, is really exciting. So I encourage anyone to just dip their toes in. Mm. I feel like we're so creating a strata nice community, places. Joe. We've, Oz Property Investors is a, a little, is a little strata community of, of its own somewhat. Oh, there you go. Oz Strata Investors. There you go, Amanda. <laughs> get the domain. Get the domain. Yeah, get the domain. It's as easy as that. Um, Amanda, how can how can people learn more? Because I know you've we've we've covered a lot, but there's so many other different topics I just want to deep dive into. How do people mm. kind of learn more from you? Well, I have just today published oh. my 300th podcast episode. So I have been running the Your Strata well Property podcast for the last six years. That's about an episode a week. Episode 300 went out today. So we're in a bit of celebration mode at uh, YSP, wow. I call it, Your Strata Property Headquarters. So the podcast is a really great library, growing huge library of information about Strata. And you can find that at yourstrataproperty.com.au. Um, dip into those podcast episodes. I've seen a lot of your uh, group members head over and check out my Facebook page. So that's just a, a public page today. That's um, on Facebook. Just search Your Strata Property. I do a lot of these kind of chats and I do my own Friday lives every couple of Fridays to um, update everyone about what's happening in Strata. So it'd be good to see you over there. There's too. always something new always yeah. is that's right yeah pe people are still loving it i mean there's uh like aaron and there's i mean there's so many questions we could have continued to ask but i just i mean I'm, do you I'm know what 
That's why I started the podcast. I used to do a live education events. So I would go, as you said, and I'd do speaking gigs in big and small rooms. And it would be about this time. And my feet would be very sore because I'd have my nice shoes on. And I'd say to people, I got to go. I got to eat. I got to sit down. And there would just be the line to the end of the room. So I get it. There is, <laughs> there is so much um, information, knowledge, education that's needed. That's why I started the podcast so that people can dip in and find that there. Um, but look, it's easy to find me online and to find what I'm doing in my community. So yeah, I'm happy to keep helping. Thanks for I love it. Well, keep well. giving back to the communities. That's what it's all about. That is what it's all about. Awesome. Is there anything else you wanted to cover off? Anything that we've missed that you wish we discussed? I want to say thank you. Thank you both for uh, inviting me here and giving me this time to share with your community. Um, and thanks for being open to the opportunity of learning more about Strata. I think when you first heard Strata Lawyer, mm, I don't know. don't know if you guys are going to be in that. So thank you for pushing through yeah. that. And yeah. <laughs> uh, we've got to change your views a little bit. <laughs> uh, that's funny that you say that it, because that's the first thing that goes through your mind. You're like, no, I don't, I don't want to do that. And then I listened to one of your podcasts. I was like, this is amazing. This is un. You just don't think about it. You don't think about all the little eccentricities that exist out of here until you're like, actually, why is that building now extending? Or how did they pay for that? Why that property just was forty million dollars. They just got new balconies, 25% floor plan, now worth 75% more, and they paid it all off with two bloody, what are they called, penthouses. Oh, That's well it. done. Yep. Amazing. Who thinks about this stuff? I think about this stuff all the time. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Anything you want to say, Jeff? I'm good. I was just going to say, yeah, um, thanks, for, yeah thanks for being a, such a passionate member of the Strata lawyer and just the Strata in general and just the property community as well. That's, um, yeah, good, good on you and hope, we'll, hope you'll have another 300 episodes at least, maybe more. I hope so Absolutely. too. Thank cool. you. Well, let's go, let's go buy a property, guys. Let's go buy a Strata property. See you later. <laughs> See ya. Thanks, everybody. Catch you next week.